everyone, it's Katrina. Today I'll be showing you some mysterious ancient places that are hard to believe. From a mysterious ancient doorway to a pyramid that you've probably never heard of. You don't want to miss out on that. The Geometry of Monument Valley Monument Valley is one of the most incredible places in the United States. The park is spread across ancient Navajo territory. Huge sandstone masterpieces rise up to 1,000 feet above the desert floor, casting monstrous shadows. The landscape is overwhelming to the senses. The valley is also full of mystery, mystery that goes back hundreds of millions of years. This whole place used to be underwater. The water drained from the valley, then 50 million years of natural wind and rain eroded the land into what you see today. Recently, giant cubes have allegedly been found in Monument Valley. These cubes are geometrically perfect squares that appear to have been cut and shaped as part of an ancient construction project. They don't appear natural, with perfectly smooth sides and uniform cube shapes. Each cube is about 20 feet long by 20 feet tall by 20 feet wide. I was serious when I said a cube. The issue is that there is no evidence the cubes were cut by human hands or normal geological processes. They do look strange and some people think they could be the work of advanced intelligence. The cubes even look as if they once fit together perfectly but were broken apart during some sort of mining process. However, as far as scientists are concerned, these are just rocks. Rocks that split apart and happen to be perfect cubes that fit together with the precision of giant Lego blocks. What are your thoughts? Let me know in the comments below. The doorway to where? Can you tell if this is real or not? It's a doorway carved onto the face of a cliff at the top of a mountain in the middle of absolutely nowhere. A doorway that appears to be suspended in midair with no possible way of reaching it. Is this an actual thing? It's apparently real, but good luck finding any kind of information on it. I've tried. The mysterious doorway appears to be all that remains of a fortress, high in the mountains of Hejin City, China. It must be real because it appears on Google Maps. There are drone videos of it. There are photographs of it, yet there isn't a single scrap of history and no record of the doorway anywhere. Rumor is that the fortress has stood in the mountains for over a thousand years. But truthfully, nobody knows. It could have been in the mountains for the last 5,000 years. Scientists know more about life on Mars than they do about this lost fortress. However, the doorway does give us some clues. There is a lot that can be learned just by analyzing the photos. Judging by its position in the middle of the unpopulated mountains, the fortress must have been used as some sort of hideout. There was probably a stairway or at least a path moving to the doorway and probably a gate. As you can see in the pictures, the mountain has eroded a lot. It looks like every time it rains, a few more feet crumble down into the valleys below. There is a good chance that the fortress has been slowly breaking apart for thousands of years, its stone walls melting like the walls of a wet sandcastle. For now, all any of us can do is marvel at this amazing place. I can only guess at how huge it was. There must have been defensive fortifications here probably cave-like dwellings within the mountain. Now all that remains is the upper section of the brick doorway, and that too will likely be gone in the next couple of years. For anyone who's been to Hejin City and knows of the doorway, please give me some info in the comments. And if you've seen it with your own two eyes, I definitely want to know what your impression was. And now for a quick break because it's shout out time. I want to give a huge thank you to R9Z Space and Deborah Lerman for supporting this channel. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos like these. The Pyramid of Kenjer Feast your eyes on the most pitiful ruin of a pyramid anywhere in Egypt. This mysterious ancient place almost doesn't even exist because it is so badly destroyed. But 3,800 years ago, in the 13th dynasty, it was a fabulous mortuary temple. This is the Pyramid of Kenjer. Found in the Saqqara Necropolis by archaeologist Gustave Jacquier in 1929, it's sandwiched between the Pyramid of Pepi II and the Pyramid of Senusret III. It's also the only pyramid that still stands. Well, the only pyramid that sort of still stands from the 13th dynasty. You're going to have to use your imagination for a little bit here. The pyramid complex once boasted two pyramids, 
with the main pyramid protected behind a perimeter wall and connected to a temple. The second pyramid, a little smaller, was also protected by a huge perimeter wall. They were both inside a kind of maze-like compound of walls. I hope you can see this place in your imagination. It's sad that the mighty pharaoh's pyramid is now as flat as a pancake when it used to stand over 120 feet tall. Gustav Jekir found its pyramidion during excavations. That's like finding a person's hat and their ashes after they spontaneously combust. It's one of the only pyramidions ever discovered. For those not in the know, a pyramidion was the heavy triangular capstone put at the top of a pyramid. Kenjer's pyramidion shows him hanging out with Atum and Ra like he was personal friends with the gods. If you've never heard of Kenjer, you're not alone. Even archaeologists don't quite know who this guy was. His time as pharaoh isn't very well documented. He was clearly wealthy and important enough to build himself a grand pyramid as his final resting place. Still, all that's really known about Kenjer is that his name means boar, so maybe he was really strong? The Cave of God's Eyes When you step foot inside Prohodna Cave in Bulgaria, somebody is watching you. But is that somebody God or the devil? Inside the central chamber of Bulgaria's creepiest cavern are two huge holes in the ceiling. Look at the view from inside the cave and tell me those don't look like a pair of humongous eyes looking down at you. On a night when the moon is full and high in the sky, the pale moonlight shines through the holes as if the eyes of God are glowing. It's something you have to see for yourself to appreciate. Locals call Brahodna Cave the Eyes of God or Devil's Eyes. Nobody seems able to agree on whether the eyes are benevolent or malevolent. The cave is a lot more than just two giant creepy eyes. In fact, it's the largest passage cave in the country and a popular place for bungee jumping. Would you be bold enough to bungee jump in a cave? If you think so, you might change your mind in a moment. While there aren't any exceptionally spooky myths surrounding the cave, there is one disturbing aspect I've left out. When it rains, water seeps through the symmetrical almond-shaped eye holes in such a way that it looks like God is crying. When this happens at night with the moonlight coming in and the rainwater forming tears on the stone, it can cause quite the impression. Do you still want to go bungee jumping here? The Samda Chun Monastery Samda Chun Monastery is unlike any place you have ever seen before and unlike anywhere you've ever visited. Unless you happen to be a mountain goat, or you have climbed to the top of the world already, you had better put Samda Chun Monastery on your bucket list right now. The monastery is located at a vertigo-inspiring height of 12,700 feet above sea level. It's in a remote corner of the Himalayas, climbing high into the clouds. But why is it here? And how do you even get to it? Getting to it is extremely difficult. You better bring your hiking shoes because it takes four hours to climb up the steep trail to reach the monastery. And that's only if you can stomach the journey through India's Ladakh region to get to the start of the trail. The last four hours of hiking isn't even the tough part. There isn't much left of the original monastery. What was once a sprawling complex covering the entire side of the crumbling mountain is now nothing more than a broken shrine a couple of broken chapels, and a few poorly maintained stupas. Samdachun Monastery hasn't been complete since it was built a thousand years ago. Although much of its history has been lost, archaeologists suspect it was completed around the 11th century as an early Tibetan Buddhist temple. According to the World Monument Fund, the temple is one of the 100 most endangered archaeological sites in the world. It's so remote that the nearby village of Samdachan didn't have electricity until August of 2017. The first road connecting the village to the rest of civilization was built in 2019. Kawachi Just like the ancient Tibetans climbed high into the Himalayas to visit the Samdachun Monastery, the ancient Nazca made pilgrimages to an isolated site deep in the desert. Kawachi is an incredible place to visit. The site is 370 acres, surrounded on all sides by sweeping desert. At one point, Kawachi was one of the most important ceremonial centers in Peru. Scientists still don't even know how truly big it is because so much of the place is buried beneath the desert. 
Over 40 mounds have already been uncovered. The mounds were the foundation blocks of structures, similar to how houses are built on concrete foundation blocks. The structures are gone, with only the mounds remaining. When it comes to ancient sites, normally they are excavated sporadically over many years by different archaeologists. In the case of Kawachi, Italian scientist Giuseppe Orefici has been leading the excavations for several decades. Early archaeologists believed Kawachi was a megalithic city. It was Giuseppe, through his tireless research, who showed that this was a place more like the Nazca Vatican than a city. The Nazca Vatican is, I guess, the best way to describe Kawachi. It was used as a gathering place for the worshippers of the strange Nazca gods. This may have been where the most important priests of the Nazca religion lived in splendor. From Kawachi, you can physically see some of the Nazca lines. The ancient center for worship most definitely had something to do with the creation of Peru's most captivating geoglyphs. Scientists just don't really know what that something is. Abandoned Canada Welcome to the largest ghost town in Canada, a place so devoid of life and so forgotten it's easy to miss. Oh, and you should also know it's cursed. The city of Antioch has almost nothing in it anymore. If you didn't know any better, you could walk right through it and not even realize you just walked through a lost city. Antioch is located in British Columbia, in a remote spot 90 miles from Prince Rupert. The region was first explored by Captain George Vancouver in 1793, but there was nobody living here until Antioch was founded in 1912, shortly after the Granby Power Company started buying land in the wilderness. Soon, the town had a population of roughly 3,000 people. Although nobody lived in the region before, it was still a popular place for trapping and hunting with the Nizga'a's indigenous people. What's interesting is that the Nizga'a had been telling tales of a mountain made of gold for centuries. It turned out the tales were rooted in reality. Shortly after the Granby Company started buying land, they struck gold. Seeing the pictures of Antioch as it is today, you might have a hard time believing this next part. After mining operations got up and running in 1912, Antioch became one of the largest producers of copper anywhere in the British Empire. During the years it was operational, the mining town produced 321.5 million grams of copper. They also produced 206 million grams of silver and a paltry 3.8 million grams of gold. I say paltry, but I wouldn't mind having 1 million grams of gold. As the city continued to flourish, more and more people arrived. The boom was more of a kaboom, with a railway being developed, a golf course, and even a hospital. Soon, Antioch had a curling rink and wooden tennis courts. Antioch went from a traditional hunting ground to a fully-fledged town in under six years. Marvel at the power of colonization. Then things went bad, and they went bad fast. The outbreak of the Spanish flu in 1918 caused locals to start dropping like flies. The town started to crumble. Then, like somebody pronounced dead who randomly wakes up at the morgue, Antioch bounced back. The 1920s saw the construction of the tallest dam in Canada at the time. It stood a whopping 156 feet high. The town seemed to be growing exponentially. But like I said at the beginning, Antioch is cursed. In 1923, the entire town was nearly burned by a forest fire. They recovered just in time for acid rain to pour down on them, scorching the trees and bleaching the hillsides like Asian orange. The town miraculously kept going until the 1930s, but the Great Depression was the final nail in the coffin. Even with the town deserted, nature wasn't done destroying Antioch. The mine closed in 1935 and the post office shut down in 1939. Once everyone was pretty much gone, forest fires engulfed the town once again in 1942 and 43. Every single wooden structure was burned. Nature wanted Antioch gone for good. Coral Castle There is a lot of controversy surrounding the creation of certain monuments of the ancient world. Did aliens have something to do with the pyramids? How did the druids move heavy stones to build Stonehenge? To put the controversy to rest, a Latvian man came up with a bizarre plan. The gravity-defying enigma of the great coral castle is the fruit of that plan. 
He was going to build his own castle using enormous stone blocks and prove that it could be done easily with just one person. Edward Leed Scalnin was engaged to be married at 25 years old. The day before his wedding, his bride got cold feet. She left and never returned, and Edward fell into a terrible depression. I mean, who can blame him? The poor guy was heartbroken. And if that wasn't bad enough, he came down with a spell of tuberculosis. After Edward healed from the heartbreak and the tuberculosis, he left his native country of Latvia and headed to America. He settled in Florida City and got to work creating one of the most impressive construction projects ever. Coral Castle is so extraordinary because Edward did everything by himself. He wanted to prove that ancient monuments weren't that hard to build. If he could do it, the ancient Egyptians could certainly do it too. Edward quarried every single piece of stone by himself. He cut the stones by himself, he stacked them by himself. Over 28 long years, Edward worked alone using nothing except simple tools that he designed himself. Only once in 1936 did Edward require outside help. He wanted to move his whole project to nearby homestead, and this required trucks. However, he still wanted to do the work himself. He had the trucks stay at his property overnight so that he could move the slabs by himself and then they were transported to the new property. In the end, Edward proved what he had set out to prove. He managed to move over 1,100 tons of stone slabs alone and without modern tools. Some of the blocks he moved weighed 30 tons. The issue people have with Coral Castle today is that Edward took his secret to the grave. He never allowed anyone to see him at work, and he never divulged his secrets. How exactly Edward built Coral Castle is still unknown. To give you an idea of how difficult some of the things he accomplished on his own were, check this out. At the entrance to Coral Castle is a huge block of stone that weighs 9 tons. The stone is used as the actual gate for getting inside. Edward was able to place the stone blocks down with such incredible precision that it moves at the slightest touch. Hey, respect where respect is due. Edward pulled off the impossible with the gate. Yet nobody really understood how impressive it was until 1986, when the gate had to be repaired. It took six grown men and a 20-ton crane to move the stone slab. They still couldn't get it in the proper position. But Edward had quarried, cut, moved, and positioned the stone by himself. Have you ever been to Coral Castle in Florida and seen Edward's work with your own eyes? What did you think? I'd love to know your opinions in the comments. The House of Wisdom The city of Baghdad in Iraq has been through a lot. It's extremely hot, over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. It's crowded, it's not very safe. And it is the city with the lowest quality of life for expats in the entire world. People get paid extra just to move there. But what many people don't realize is that Baghdad, 1,200 years ago, was the center of the universe. For 500 years, the smartest scholars from around the globe gathered in Baghdad to share ideas and advance science. Baghdad had taken on the role Athens had a thousand years earlier as the intellectual capital of the world. Baghdad was once the biggest city in the world and the richest city in the world. And for 200 years, it held the most impressive library in the world. The House of Knowledge was equivalent to the Library of Alexandria. It was such a legendary library that it attracted every kind of academic mind from every corner of the known world. Great mathematicians traveled vast distances to study the library. Zoological experts, astronomers, occultists, alchemists, every type of academic wanted to research in the House of Knowledge. The library was commissioned by Caliph Harun al-Rashid during his reign between 786 and 809. He wanted to collect all the scientific works of the world. 30 years after the library was built, it was so big that Harun al-Rashid's successor had to build extensions to fit more books and scrolls. I don't have an exact number of books that were in the library, but it must have been a lot. 
The Library of Alexandria had between 100,000 and 200,000 books, according to some figures. The House of Knowledge likely had even more. It saddens me to say that you cannot visit this excellent house of learning today. You haven't been able to visit it for almost 800 years. When Mongols laid siege to Baghdad in 1258, the Mongols burned the library to the ground. The House of Wisdom was the one place in the world where all the knowledge of the past thousand years was being stored and the Mongols set everything on fire. Castle of Rocca Calastio Italy isn't just vineyards, Roman amphitheaters, and spaghetti. The old Roman stomping ground is also home to some fantastic castles, just like everywhere else in Europe. People often forget that Italy experienced the Middle Ages just like everyone else, and castles went up on hilltops across the country, like the mountaintop fortress outside Calasio. This place is amazing, a snapshot of a fantasy. It's not somewhere you find on a tourist map, and it's not something that there's even that much information about. The castle of Rocca Calastio Palazzo is over 1,000 years old, partially in ruins, and stands at a whopping height of 4,800 feet above sea level. If that sounds high to you, that's because it is. This Italian castle is the highest medieval stronghold, no, the highest stronghold period in the Apennine Mountains. Feast your eyes on that landscape. The castle dominates the hilly region from its incredible vantage like an eagle high in a nest. It's a wonder the stone castle was ever built at such a high and precarious position. Imagine the backbreaking labor of bringing the stones up the side of the mountain. No royalty ever lived here. Nobody even knows who built the fortress. The first historical record mentioning the castle of Rocca Calascio is from 1380. The castle began its life in the 10th century as a single watchtower, erected at the peak of the mountain. Over the next 300 years, the watchtower grew and expanded. There were more towers added, an inner courtyard, and places for the soldiers to live. The castle was only ever used for defensive purposes. It was only intended to accommodate troops, but then it never saw any action. After standing for over 450 years, just itching to be useful for at least one battle, the castle of Rocca Calascio was brought down by an earthquake in 1461. Then it got hit a second time in 1703. The poor castle just can't catch a break. The unusual chapel. You won't believe how old this unusual little chapel is. It looks as if it was plucked from a children's fairy tale and placed in a lush garden. The chapel is hidden in the woodland of Guernsey, an island in the English Channel that isn't technically part of the UK, but is a British Crown dependency. It is very small, don't let the images trick you. It's considered the smallest functioning chapel in Europe, which means it's almost definitely the smallest functioning chapel in the world. It might be small, but its history is huge. The story of the Little Chapel, its actual name is Little Chapel, takes us back to Guernsey in December 1913. Brother Diodat Antoine was stricken by the beauty of the Basilica of the Immaculate Conception in Lourdes in France. The Basilica is one of the most important pilgrimage sites in Europe, and as you can see, a beautiful example of medieval architecture. When Brother Antoine arrived in Guernsey, he was inspired to create a miniature version of what he had seen in France. This was the start of a very long construction project. Brother Antoine made his first version of a tiny chapel, but it received brutal criticism from the other brothers of his order. He demolished the first version and built a second one. The second chapel was tiny but usable. It was officially blessed in July of 1914. There was enough room inside for four people, but not room for the Bishop of Portsmouth. When the Bishop of Portsmouth showed up in 1923 to see the mini version of the Basilica of Lourdes, he was too plump to fit through the door. Aghast, Brother Antoine tore down the chapel and got to work building a third one that would accommodate the bishop. Every single day, Brother Antoine collected pebbles from the shore and tiny shards of china glass with which to decorate his third and final rendition of the little chapel. After the Daily Mirror ran a story on what he was doing, suddenly people from around the world were sending him bits of China and donating Mother of Pearls. Brother Antoine worked tirelessly for years on the chapel and it was almost finished. But in 1939, war changed everything. Antoine returned to France, where he died. He never saw the final version of 
have his chapel completed. It was utterly tragic. He had worked his whole life on it, and just as it was nearing completion, his life ran out. The work was picked up by Brother Cephas, who continued until he retired in 1965. The chapel was done, but in terrible condition. Nobody bothered taking care of it, and so it quickly started to decay. In 1977, a committee was charged with restoring the chapel, but it wouldn't be until 2014 that restoration work was done to make the chapel stable. Nowadays, you would never know the chapel was worked on as recently as the last decade. It looks old, ancient even, like it was made of glass by some crazed medieval hermit. The Akiawasi Machu Picchu is often looked at as a single site, which it is, but many tourists who wander the ruins don't realize they are moving through multiple complexes. Complexes like Akiawasi, also known as the House of the Virgins of the Sun. It's the biggest and perhaps most mysterious part of Machu Picchu. The complex has a single entrance, one door from which people could enter or exit. The only people allowed inside were women who had dedicated themselves to religious life. They were the Inca versions of nuns, but with a bit of a twist. With a big twist, actually. The women of the House of the Virgins of the Sun were chosen strictly for their superior beauty. No ugly nuns allowed. Harsh, totally, I agree. But that was the way the Inca did it. And now, in about three seconds, things are going to take a seriously non-progressive turn. Did you know in the Inca Empire, every girl was required to get busy and to marry? Girls who kept their virginity were considered weak and non-contributing members of society. This was true for all young women women except the Akyas, who were required to remain virgins, hence the name Virgins of the Sun. The term Akyas means chosen women in Quechua, the Inca language. To become one of these chosen women was considered a great honor, but it was also a lot of hard work. Each year, an Incan official traveled across the empire in search of young girls to join the religious order. The girls selected were typically between 8 and 10. The girls were not only selected for their beauty, but also for their skills and intelligence. Commoners were never selected, only young girls from elite Inca families. Families considered it a great privilege to donate one of their daughters to the Virgins of the Sun. For the next seven years, the Akyas or Aklas trained rigorously. They were sent to training facilities known as Akyawasi. Each facility held about 200 chosen women. They were taught how to weave and how to prepare chicha. Chicha is an ancient Inca beverage still served in South America today. It's also extremely strong and was used in religious ceremonies. Some women were sent to ceremonial centers like Machu Picchu, where they acted as priestesses at special houses. Part of their training was to learn everything about Inca religion. They were considered the virgin wives of Inti, god of the sun. But only a part of their existence was wrapped up in religion. Many, and probably the majority, were given away as wives to important members of Inca society. If they didn't become priestesses in religious centers, they had the prestige and special training of having been selected as a child. Everyone knew that these women were not only beautiful, but educated and from noble families. Families. So who wouldn't want to marry them? There was one more thing Akyas were used for. The most beautiful women of all were often selected as human sacrifices in religious rituals. While it was certainly a high honor, it was also very unpleasant. In this case, it just didn't pay to be beautiful. The Kaaba this is the Kaaba, the most important shrine in all of Islam. It's also an ancient place with a long and storied past. The truth of the Kaaba is a whirlwind adventure that will take us back to the earliest days of the pre-Islamic tribes of the Middle East. You may have seen the Kaaba before in videos of thousands of Muslims surrounding the great big cube. Those who are nearest to it reach their arms out and kneel in prayer. The rest walk in huge, surging crowds around it. But what is the Kaaba, and why is it the center of Mecca? Let's start with the name. Kaaba literally translates to cube in Arabic. It's a sizable square building, but the images don't do it justice. In pictures, the Kaaba looks completely black and decorated in gold. In reality, the Kaaba is draped in an elegant veil of silk and cotton. Five times a day, Muslims must stop and pray. If you've ever visited the Muslim world, perhaps you've noticed that five times a day, life just sort of stops. The prayer bells sound and all Muslims stop to pray in the 
the direction of Mecca. This has been going on since 624 AD. Each Muslim aspires and is encouraged to undertake the annual pilgrimage known as the Hajj. When the pilgrims arrive in Mecca, they gather in the courtyard around the huge cube, circumnavigate it, and try to get close to it. Those who reach it try to touch and kiss the black stone. In the Muslim faith, it's believed Abraham and his son Ismail were the ones who built the Kaaba. They constructed a small rectangular structure with no roof to worship their god. This was during the Quraysh tribe's rule over Mecca in 608 AD, prior to the rise of Islam. When the Prophet Muhammad was driven from Mecca in 620 AD, this small shrine became a focal point for early Muslim worship. When he returned later, he found the shrine to house statues of pagan gods and the mythical black stone. The black stone was given to Ibrahim by Archangel Gabriel. Muhammad destroyed the idols, and the black stone has remained in the Kaaba ever since. Historically speaking, no one knows how much of the story is actually true. The black stone embedded in the eastern corner of the Kaaba is said to be the original one, a real rock brought down from heaven by an angel. Thanks for watching. Be sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already and stick around for more older content that you might have missed. The Chronicles of Georgia The Georgian Chronicle is a fantastic superstructure built from massive stone pillars in the country of Georgia. It looks like something you might see in a fantasy movie, a Stonehenge full of history. These huge greenish-colored pillars erected at the very edge of a mountain overlook the blue sea beyond. While it looks very ancient, the building was made as recently as 1980 by the famous sculptor Zurab Saratelli. Even though the monument is so new, it is still rich in Georgian history. Every one of the pillars is depicted with scenes from historical and religious events. Some of these structures are covered in images of Jesus Christ, others with Georgian poets, and some with the most famous people who ever came out of Georgia such as kings and authors. In total, there are 16 giant pillars, all of them forming a perfectly symmetrical square open-air temple. Unfortunately, the Georgian Chronicle was never finished. Zora began work in 1985, but with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, funds ran out, things changed very quickly, and the artist never got to finish his masterpiece. The Chichen Itza Observatories El Caracol at Chichen Itza, when you see it from the right angle, definitely looks like a domed observatory. The top of the structure is broken, but it still looks like there should be a telescope sticking out from the roof and a Maya scientist sitting in there studying the stars. While that's obviously not the case, there is archaeological evidence in this ancient Maya city that El Caracol was used as an observatory. The structure was built around the year 906 as a way for the Maya to observe the sky. One of the issues with living in the Yucatan Peninsula 1,000 years ago was that you didn't exactly have the best view of the heavens. The brush was so thick, the jungle so lush, and the vegetation so tall that the canopy almost always blocked out the night sky. So, in the city of Chichen Itza, they built an observatory on a tall platform that allowed for people to get a full glimpse of the stars high above the trees. The main purpose of this observatory actually seems to be observing the planet Venus. Nobody exactly knows why, but the Maya were obsessed with this planet. They wrote down that it appeared in the west and then vanished in the east, depending on the time of the year, and they knew it took 584 days to cycle around the sun. They also investigated at least 29 other astronomical events at this particular observatory. Archaeologists know this because of the sight lines found inside the structure, which directed the eye toward where the astronomical event was to take place. For example, the summer and winter solstices. The Untouched Irish Tomb A farmer in Ireland was working in his field as usual when he found something amazing. Even though he'd covered this place many times before, this time he discovered the entrance to an ancient tomb that had been untouched for 4,000 years. This unbelievable discovery was made on the southern part of the Dingle Peninsula. The farmer had actually been using an excavator to lift up a big rock that was in his way when it revealed a hidden chamber. The rock was actually the capstone to the tomb, and inside was a set of human bones. Archaeologists have dated the tomb back to the Bronze Age, saying it could be anywhere between 2,500 and 4,000 years old. It's a little different from other Bronze Age tombs because the entire thing was built underground. This suggests 
suggests it could be even older. Michael O'Colleen, a local archaeologist, said it's an incredibly rare discovery because nobody had touched it. It could prove invaluable in the coming months to help reveal more about the prehistoric burial rituals of Ireland. People have been living on the Dingle Peninsula for at least 6,000 years, but this is definitely one of the more advanced tombs from prehistoric days that's ever been found. It would have taken a significant amount of work, suggesting whoever was buried here had been a very important person. Other amazing archaeological sites in the region include burial grounds and beehive-shaped huts built by the ancient Celts. The Kutub Minaret The Kutub Minar or Minaret is an ancient tower from the 12th century that can be found in Delhi, India. It stands over 240 feet tall and looms over the entire surrounding area. It's one of the most iconic monuments in the capital that most people have never even heard of. Most historians agree it was built as part of a celebration of victory and had probably been inspired by similar minarets or tall towers in Afghanistan. It was the first Sultan of Delhi, Qutbuddin Aybak, who ordered the monument to be built in 1192. This was after he defeated the ruling Hindus and took control of India for himself. The tower wasn't finished all at once. First came the base of the sandstone pillar, and then over the course of three more rulers, the monument was expanded. It continued to be built upward and renovated until it stood five stories tall. It takes 379 steps to reach the very top of the tower, something nobody with a fear of heights should even try to attempt. The tower has survived quite a lot over the past 800 years. It's been struck by lightning at least twice, and the cupola at the top fell over when it got hit by an earthquake. In fact, the tower survived two major earthquakes with minimal damage. Besides the tower, there's the fortified complex which houses it, and this place has a controversial history. Hundreds of years ago, 27 Hindu temples were destroyed, and the debris from the temples was used to construct the very first mosque Delhi ever saw. This was all part of the exchange when the Sultan took over and tried to force a religious change across the country. There's also a 20-foot-high pillar here made of solid iron that survived 1,600 years. Among the arches there is probably the tomb of a sultan hidden somewhere beneath the pillar. Iraqi Demon Cave Archaeologists in Iraq recently discovered a creepy demon cave. They didn't find any actual demons inside, but researchers did come across an ancient clay tablet from 2,700 years ago. On the clay tablet is a horn figure depicted as half-human and half-goat, basically your typical everyday demon. But to the ancient Assyrians, this demon's name was Bennu. Like the character Satan that came later, he had hoofed feet, a forked tail, and a snake's tongue poking out from his mouth. Even stranger is the fact that the Assyrians believed it was Bennu who was responsible for a very specific medical condition. Back then, any ailment of the mind or body that wasn't sustained in the physical world attributed this to a demon. If someone was blind, if they got sick, or if they were epileptic, it was all blamed on a demon and Bennu was believed to be the cause of epileptic fits. On the clay tablet, there's even a description of symptoms associated with someone who's been afflicted by the goat demon, seizures, loss of sanity, and crying out. Big thank you to Leslie, aka Ivory Princess, and Joseph Thomas for supporting this channel. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already to join the Origins Explained family. Secret Christian Town The ancient city of Marea was a bustling port town located on the northern coast of Egypt during the Roman era. This was long after the days of the pharaohs when Egypt belonged to the mighty Roman Empire. Marea was likely founded during the conquest of Alexander the Great in 332 BC, but it wasn't for 300 years that it would become a prosperous port city under Roman rule. Just recently, archaeologists came across a mysterious hub built in the city sometime in the 6th century by Christian pilgrims. A Christian hub being built in the 6th century during the Islamic conquest came as quite a shock to archaeologists. After the Romans were gone, the Muslims conquered Egypt between 639 and 646. During this time, they didn't build any additional towns and cities. They did enough slaughtering and there were enough towns built by the Romans and Macedonians that construction was useless. They definitely wouldn't have built any Christian cities. In any case, somebody built a tiny Christian town inside the ruins of a large Roman farmstead. Archaeologists figure this was probably a stop on the way for European Christians to visit the tomb of the martyr Saint Menas of Egypt. They would have crossed the Mediterranean to Alexandria, taken a boat about 30 miles to Marea, and then spent the night there. Kai Din Tomb 
The Kai Din tomb is where the body of the 12th emperor of the Nguyen dynasty is buried. He was the very last king of Vietnam to build a mausoleum for himself. And even though this great and imposing tomb looks like a dark temple from a bygone age, it was in fact built in the 1920s. Kai Din died before it could ever be completed, and his son, Emperor Bao Dai, finished it for him. Kai Din ruled Vietnam at a time when the world was changing. World War I had just finished, World War II wasn't yet on the horizon, and the world was quickly modernizing. Nonetheless, he continued to build all kinds of impressive traditional structures in central Vietnam, mostly around the Hue Imperial Citadel. His tomb, for example, is unlike any other tomb in Southeast Asia. The gates are decorated with clouds and dragons. The stonework is all black and charcoal colored, giving the place a dark and mysterious atmosphere. And the old king's body is housed at the very top of the structure after climbing 126 stairs to reach the burial chamber. The Viking Beer Hall In northern Scotland, archaeologists have made a fantastic discovery on the island of Rousay. They dug up the crumbled foundation of an ancient Viking beer hall. Evidence shows the hall was open from the 10th to the 12th centuries, over 200 years. But what makes it a little more interesting than other beer halls is that it probably served only the most respected of the Vikings. It was for elite members of society only, a real fancy club that not just anyone could show up to. He had to be on the list, otherwise you could go drink with the rest of the peasants. There's not much left of this elite beer hall these days fragmented pieces of pottery, old chunks of Norse trash, and the busted stones of what had once been walls. But at one time, this thing had been huge. It was 43 feet long, with stone benches positioned along the walls on either side of the building. This was a place specifically for drinking ale and getting rowdy. The beer hall was discovered at the archaeological site of the Scale Farmstead, a Viking settlement that had likely been inhabited for at least 1,000 years. It was archaeologists with the University of the High Islands and islands who have been digging here for years, sifting through ancient trash heaps and poking holes in the ground in search of discoveries just like this one. Ancient Roman Worship Complex Just this year, French archaeologists discovered the remains of an ancient worship complex in Brittany, dated 2,100 years old. The complex was built following the Roman conquest of the lands of Gaul in the 1st century BC, after the Romans beat down the tribes that had been wandering across France. Years later, the Gauls, now integrated into Roman society, went to the top of a hill with beautiful views of the Flume Valley below and built two massive temples. Archaeologists believe one of them was dedicated to Mars and Jupiter. Mars was the god of war and Jupiter was the king of the gods. The second temple is a little more mysterious since archaeologists can't tell exactly who was worshipped in it. The complex was used at least until around the beginning of the end of the Roman Empire. In the 4th century AD, it would have gone out of style just around the time that Christianity was spreading outside the capital and into places like France. The construction of the temple shows how the local population integrated with the Roman religion after they were subjugated. Even the rebellious Gaulish Rhydones tribe, who lived in Brittany since prehistoric times, quickly adopted the Roman religion when they didn't have a choice. The Ajanta Caves The Ajanta Caves are hidden in the hills of northwestern India, 200 miles from the wild city streets of Mumbai. They were carved into the face of a mountain starting around 2,200 years ago. They were discovered totally by chance in 1819 by British soldiers who were hunting in the area. Ever since, the caves have been a major source of pride for India and one of the greatest places to see ancient Indian art and architecture. Construction here went on up until around 650 AD, or for at least 800 consecutive years. The result is that there are over 30 massive caves that have been chiseled into the solid rock face of the cliffs by hand, each one dedicated to the life of the Buddha. Every one of these is filled with massive sculptures sculptures, murals carved into the walls, painted ceilings like at the Sistine Chapel, and monuments you'd never think possible to carve inside it. These days, the Ajanta Caves is one of the most popular architectural sites in all of India. There is really nowhere else in the country that compares to the sheer scope of what went on here. It's basically an underground city, which took 800 years of manpower and ingenuity to create. Even more impressive is the fact that it was created entirely by monks, who then lived in absolute seclusion inside the temples and chambers they carved with their own hands. St. Patrick's Purgatory St. Patrick's Purgatory can be found in County Donegal, Ireland, on a small island in the middle of a lake known as Loch Derg. 
While this isn't actually purgatory, it is instead a monastery that was built over what the locals once believed to be a gateway to hell. So close enough. As you can imagine, it's an unusual place. According to legend, Jesus showed St. Patrick a cave on this tiny island. When St. Patrick looked into the darkness, he had a sudden and terrible vision of the punishments of hell. St. Patrick then continued to use the cave as proof of what would happen to the local people if they didn't obey the laws of God. Anyone who looked in the cave was able to see the kinds of torments and miseries that were happening in the dark part of the afterlife. It was basically a really, really powerful scare tactic. But of course, this is just a story. We don't know if St. Patrick was really here, or if he really did see a vision of horrible cruelty when looking into the mouth of the mysterious cave. What we know for sure is that the monastery on the island is still standing. At least part of it is. The structure was built sometime before the 15th century, with nothing left of it today except its foundation and some bare stones from its walls. Bimkund there is a mysterious pool in India that seems to be bottomless. It's called Bhimkund, and no scientist has ever been able to figure out how deep it is. The pool is located near Bajna village and is a natural water tank that gets its source from deep within a cave. There's a small temple-like structure built beside it for easy access so that visitors can bathe in its supposedly holy waters. Going down to the pools is an adventure in itself. You have to climb an ancient stairway down into an underground cavern in order to finally reach the pool far below. But we don't actually know much about this mysterious pool. Scientists allegedly probed Bimkund, trying to figure out its depth, but never managed to get any correct readings. They put their instruments down over 600 feet, but the water just kept going. It could very well be the deepest natural pool anywhere on the planet, but no one knows for certain because we've never gotten definitive measurements. This is what the locals say anyway, who are probably quite happy to keep the pool bottomless and the mystery alive. The truth is that the pool can almost definitely be measured if a professional geologist took enough time to do it, but then that would ruin the mystique of the place. The Phrygian Valley The Phrygian Valley was once the heartland of the great Phrygian kingdom. These ancient people occupied most of Turkey, rising to power after the Hittite Empire collapsed around the year 1200 BC. By 700 BC, the Phrygia had become the dominant culture in the region. We know they were likely allies with the Trojans during the epic Trojan War. The famous King Midas, the one who turned all he touched to gold, was a king of Phrygia. Even Alexander the Great ventured to Phrygia during his travels as he tried to become the king of the world. The point is that there is a lot of history in the region. The Phrygian Valley is enormous stretching hundreds of miles and boasting some of the most unbelievable archaeological sites in the world. For example, Gordian is here, the ancient Phrygian capital that reached its peak around 600 BC. This is where the tomb of great King Midas can be found. Then there's Yazilikaya, or more commonly known as the Midas Monument. It's a massive tomb facade that isn't really a tomb. Someone simply carved a giant tomb face into a rock probably during the 7th century BC. Then at the bottom, where the entrance to the tomb should have been, was only a small niche for a statue of the goddess Cybele. That statue is gone now, and the whole place is in ruins. The truly magical part about the Phrygian Valley is the sheer scope of archaeological wonder. You can't go far in any direction without stumbling upon some ancient monument, hidden tomb, or lost city. Why do you think the Midas Monument was built to look like a tomb facade? I'd like to read your theories in the comments. The Great Gate of Madagascar The Ambohimanga Main Gate is probably an archaeological marvel you've never heard of before. That's because it comes from a town built in the 18th century in rural Madagascar, which isn't exactly an archaeological hotspot. The town of Ambohimanga was naturally shielded by forests, but this wasn't enough to keep them from being attacked. They had to erect a large wall surrounding the city to keep the royal family safe. So the royal family took safety to a level never before seen on this island nation. A huge wall was thrown up along with seven outer gates to protect those within. The main gate wasn't so much a door as it was an enormous stone disc. It was like something you would expect to see in a movie blocking the entrance to a magical tomb. The door of the gate was a standing stone weighing 12 tons. It was so ridiculously big that the only way to move it was with 20 strong people pushing it aside. 
The piece of stone was over 130 feet in circumference. Every night, guards would roll the stone into its position, completely blocking all traffic in and out of the town. It was a pretty clever idea, and it worked for the people of the city. These days, the stone is stuck in place, tucked beside the main entranceway no longer used. But it is still there, as is the walled city of the Marina Kingdom, who ruled over this region 300 years ago. There are royal burial grounds inside the city, pavilions, and even more standing stones. Mont Saint-Michel Mont Saint-Michel is arguably the most amazing and most picturesque place in all of France. It also looks like something straight out of a Disney movie. Mont Saint-Michel is the name of an island kept by an abbey that seems to defy gravity. Mont Saint-Michel can trace its origin back to the early 8th century. In the nearby town of Avranches, a bishop by the name of Albert had a vision. He claimed to have been visited by the archangel Michael, who pressured him into building a church on top of an island just out to sea. This island would become the foundation for the abbey in the middle of a bay between Normandy and Brittany. Because of its beautiful location, Mont Saint-Michel has been capturing people's imaginations for centuries. From the year 966 on, the Dukes of Normandy all supported the development of a massive Benedictine abbey on top of this small island. After the Dukes of Normandy, the French kings continued to support the development with whatever funds and political muscle was needed. The place became a major center for learning, with some of the brightest minds in Europe flocking to the abbey to study and write manuscripts. It's amazing because the abbey still stands today. There are massive walls around the island originally designed to keep the English out. Today, they are all historical buildings. There is even a small village tucked onto the lower tiers of the island where people used to live. Have you ever visited Mont Saint-Michel? Or do you want to? If so, let me know about your experience in the comments. Big shout out to Molly Perkins and Trey Issues 13. Thanks so much for supporting this channel. If you are new here, welcome and be sure to hit that subscribe button for more videos like these. The Caves of Ventanillas de Otusco. The archaeological site of Ventanillas de Otusco in Peru is as unique as it gets. The place is located over 6,000 feet above sea level, a series of artificial caves that were used around 2,000 years ago for burying the dead. The Cajamarca culture of this region carved narrow holes into the cliffside here, reminiscent of body storage drawers you see in morgues. They then stored their dead inside the carved holes, one to each cubby. This created a massive open-air necropolis with hundreds of deceased looking down into the valleys below. When archaeologists started excavating the necropolis, they were confused about one major thing. They never found any complete skeletons inside the cubby holes. This indicated the caves were used as secondary burial locations. What this means is that when the Cajamarca buried someone, the corpse was put in the ground. Then, after some decomposition had happened, their skull and a handful of their bones were taken out of the ground. These were transported to the caves and stored inside one of the niches. What's strange is that archaeologists have no idea why. They think it has something to do with a death cult, but don't have much of a better explanation than that. It's a total mystery. Grimes Point Grimes Point prehistoric rock site is located just outside the town of Fallon in Nevada. You wouldn't even know you were walking through an archaeological zone if not for the signs pointing out the rocks covered in mysterious petroglyphs. It was here that Native Americans left their mark over 8,000 years ago. Not only did the natives leave behind some very curious petroglyphs carved onto the red rocks of the desert, they also left behind some artifacts. Archaeologists studying the site have found pieces of bone and shell and even primitive tools. But for all the research that has been done here, nobody has managed to decipher the meaning of the petroglyphs. Some say the drawings are the constellations in the night sky. Some say it's just a bunch of nonsense scribbled on the boulders. The one thing that's for sure is that when you visit Grimes Point and see the petroglyphs for yourself, your imagination can run wild. Underground Pyramid in Bolivia At the ancient fortress of Tiwanaku in western Bolivia, archaeologists discovered an underground pyramid. The archaeologists are with the Tiwanaku Archaeological Research Center. They use ground-penetrating radar to identify anomalies underneath the ancient capital of the most important civilization in South America prior to the Inca. These anomalies appear to be mostly monoliths, but there is also one giant anomaly that looks an awful lot like a pyramid. In other words, there are multiple structures, perhaps an entire lost piece of the city, 
hiding underneath the ground. Researchers say it will take another five years for them to properly excavate the area and see what's actually under their feet. Now, what's even more interesting is that we don't really know who lived in Tiwanaku. Scientists simply call them the Tiwanaku culture. We know that they have close ties to the Wadi people and may have even influenced the Inca who came to power in the north. The people of Tiwanaku flourished from around the year 300 to 1000 AD, with the city becoming one of the biggest and most powerful in all of ancient America. The nearby Lake Titicaca was considered to be the center of the earth, the very place where humans first appeared on the planet. It was Lord Viracocha, the creator of all things, who chose Tiwanaku to be the capital of civilization, according to myth. But alas, this great city only lasted 700 years before being abandoned and left to ruin. How in the world they could have buried a pyramid underneath it is a mystery. Mammoth Cave Mammoth Cave is one of the most mysterious places not only in Kentucky, but in all of the United States. It is an ancient underground labyrinth with a depth that nobody has ever been able to measure. The surface of Mammoth Cave National Park is about 80 square miles, but underneath, going deep into the subterranean world hidden below, the area remains shrouded in mystery. There are at least 400 miles of passages and dark caverns that have never been seen by human eyes. That's on top of the 365 miles that have already been mapped. Even today, new caverns are continuously being discovered. As you might have guessed, this is the longest known cave system in the world, according to National Geographic. It's dangerous, dark, and people may have lived in it as far back as 5,000 years. Archaeologists have found proof of mineral mining dating back 3,000 years, in the way of ancient mining tools left on the passage floors. But we don't actually know how important this place was to the Native Americans. It's so deep and so confusing and so hard to actually excavate that nobody knows if humans lived in it or even created subterranean cities deep below the ground. Have you ever been here? Let me know your experience in the comments! Dos du Dragon Dos du Dragon is a natural protrusion sticking out in the Indian Ocean that looks like a sleeping dragon. It's located on the northern tip of Grand Comor Island, off the coast of East Africa, formed over millions of years. For as long as people have lived on the island, they've referred to the natural formation as the dragon's back. The ridge of the protrusion is covered in standing stones that give life to the dragon's spine, while mossy rocks make the beast look as if it has real shining scales. But of course, it's not a real dragon, at least not that anybody has been able to prove. If there really is a dragon underneath the mossy rocks, I think everyone on Earth would be extremely shocked. The island itself formed millions of years ago thanks to volcanic activity. One of the nearby volcanoes erupted in 2006. There isn't much in the way of archaeological sites here, it's really the dragon that's the main attraction. There is a walking path along the ridges of its spine, allowing visitors to take in the unbelievable scenery as they stroll along the back of the dragon. Thanks for watching! Which of these amazing, mysterious places would you love to visit if you had the chance? Let me know in the comments below, and be sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. See you soon! Bye!